Hey everyone, so in today's video I'm going to cover 10 drawing tips that are geared towards beginners. If you're not a beginner you probably know most of this stuff, but it's always nice to get a little refresher. And speaking of learning new things, today's video is brought to you by my sponsor Skillshare. Skillshare.com consists of many creatives such as yourselves who are interested in either learning or teaching about various creative subjects. There are over 20,000 classes on Skillshare, so there's so much to discover if you're looking to learn more about anatomy, lighting, shading, even things like using editing programs to turn your art into videos. There is everything there. And if you have a skill you want to share with the world, you can even sign up to become a teacher and make money off your videos. With the premium membership, you unlock every single class. You can watch as many of them as you want, and it's about $10 a month for the annual plan. If you use my link in the video description, you can get your first two months for free, and this offer is only for the first 500 people to sign up through my link. So if this video leaves you thirsting for more art knowledge, be sure to check out Skillshare. So now let's move on to the 10 drawing tips. These are kind of random, but they're things that I think are very helpful for people who are just getting started out. So tip number one is don't worry about symmetry. I feel like beginners do stress about symmetry a lot. They're like, oh, I draw one eye, the other one's gotta match exactly, and they feel like it all needs to be perfect. But here's the truth. Symmetry is boring. Imperfections can actually make your art feel more fluid and alive. So with this example, I drew this face. And then for the second one, I took just this half and I mirrored it over so that it was perfectly symmetrical. And it's not that this looks bad, it's just that this one felt more lively in my opinion. See how the top of her hair kind of rises a bit more on this side? Here one cheek's a little bit wider than the other. It's not stuff I did intentionally, but it's just, it feels more natural that way. People aren't perfectly symmetrical in real life anyway, so why try to make your art perfectly symmetrical? Also, symmetry can just make your art look very stiff and boring. Sometimes it's a conscious design choice to have the composition very symmetrical, but don't feel like everything needs to be that way. And don't feel like you need to draw every character from the front. I feel like that is the default that beginners start with, and they draw every single drawing a character from the front. If you draw the character from a slight angle, you don't even have to worry about symmetry. So try adding more interesting angles to your art and then you won't even have to stress about it. <laughs> and when you do draw a character from the front, again, just draw and don't worry about everything being perfectly aligned or like the eyebrows being perfect. Like even what they say in real life, your eyebrows are sisters, not twins. I do sometimes flip things in Photoshop when I'm working digitally, but I try to avoid that if possible. Sometimes I just use it to speed things up, but then I'll do the inking or the coloring separately so that it's not like the whole thing is mirrored, just the sketch was mirrored, and then everything else is not so that there is some variation. Because you can totally tell when you look at someone's art and you're like, oh, they just totally took that eye and mirrored it to the other side. They didn't even do anything to try to make it look a bit different. If you're gonna mirror it, try to just like tweak little things here and there. Maybe the highlights aren't quite the same size or one lash line is just slightly thicker. Just make it less obvious that you mirrored it because perfect symmetry looks strange. Tip number two is that you should try to randomize the elements in your drawing. I have a few different examples for this. Here's the first one. In the first square, the dots are roughly all the same size and they're roughly equally spaced. They're not aligned in a perfect pattern in rows, but they're still equally spaced out somewhat. It just feels a little boring. Whereas with this one, I have some bigger circles, some smaller ones, and there are also little clusters. Some of them are really close to each other, some are more spaced out. It's more random. So this looks a lot better than this. I listed some examples of things this would apply to, like stars, snow, glitter, sand slash stone, and pretty much anything that requires stippling. You wanna randomize both the placement of the dots and the size of the dots. Here's another example of randomizing things to make it more interesting. This also relates back to our first point we talked about, about symmetry, because this one's very symmetrical, very boring. With this little leafy stem, all the leaves are the same size, the sticks are all straight, they're all pointing perfectly out, and they're all lined up. It's just very blah. 
With this one, I gave it some curve. The leaves are different sizes. I tried curving the branches in different directions. The leaves are curved in different directions. This one, you're seeing it from the side. You're not even seeing it from straight on. This could apply to so many things. Like let's say you have some trees in the background of your drawing. They don't all have to be the same height, even if they're the same type of tree. Some can be thicker, some can be thinner, and they can be spaced out in a random way. It can apply to a lot. I have one more example for this point and it's hair. When drawing locks of hair, they don't have to be the same size pointing the same direction. Add some curve to them, make some bigger, some smaller, some are longer, some are shorter. These ones are curling this way, these two are curling this way. The variation makes it a lot more interesting than this one. Even with something like a uniform where all the characters are wearing the same uniform. Maybe someone wears their tie a little looser than someone else. Maybe one character rolls up their sleeves. Maybe one character wears tall socks with their skirt and one wears short socks. There's little variations like that you can make in any case. Point number three is to do studies slash learn from reference. Contrary to a lot of people's beliefs, <laughs> you're not born knowing how to draw everything. Think of how a kid draws a tree. They draw something like this, and then a big poofy thing on top like that. It's like a cotton ball on a stick. They're drawing a simplified version of a tree or what they think a tree looks like. Take an object you don't know very well, try drawing it from memory, and then try drawing it while actually looking at that object and you're gonna have two entirely different results. And there's no shame in referencing. People aren't born knowing what every detail of every item looks like. Even something like your toothbrush that you see every day, hopefully. <laughs> if you were to draw it from memory right now, you probably would not get all the details right. You think you know what it looks like, but do you really? Now, once you've drawn items from reference enough times, you definitely can draw it very well from memory, but that's something you have to work up to. So do not be afraid to use photo reference. Even if you're stylizing the image, it could be a real photo of a real object, but you wanna draw a cartoony version of that object, but you're still using the reference to incorporate those real details, but simplifying it. Your goal is not necessarily to replicate the picture exactly, unless you want to do photo realism. But for me, I do more cartoony stuff, but I still reference real photos and I still do studies of real people. I'll just sometimes stylize it a little bit or I won't worry about capturing that person's exact likeness because that's not my goal. I'm just trying to learn facial anatomy or maybe I'm trying to study the lighting in that particular photo. There's so many things you could be studying. Even if you normally draw cartoony, you can still do studies that are realistic where you are trying to copy the photo exactly. There's always a way to learn from reference. Now, moving on to tip number four. I see a lot of comments from people being like, okay, I have my sketch and I really like it, but I'm scared to ink it or color it because I'm scared I'm gonna mess it up. That is a very valid fear to have because there is the very real possibility that you will mess it up. Plus, sketches have a nice charm to them because they're so loose and sometimes when you ink it, it just feels less dynamic. For me, I hardly ever ink and color on the same piece of paper that I sketched on. Because one, it's nice to preserve the sketch. Two, sometimes I don't know I want to turn my sketch into a fully colored piece and so it's on a paper that is not suitable for markers or just not ideal. And three, I often press too hard to the point where I wouldn't be able to fully erase the pencil anyway and you would still see some of the pencil lines in the final product. So when I want to color, I almost always trace it onto a new piece of paper. There are light boxes and light pads designed to light up and make it so you can see through the paper. You can also just use a screen like an iPad screen, a TV screen, or even a window if it's daytime. So if you're worried about ruining your sketch, you don't have to. Tip number five is to try to tell a story with your art. Now, if you're just doing random doodles in your sketchbook, it's not like everything needs a story, but sometimes having a story can help you think of a cool idea of what to draw or help you figure out a pose. And in other cases, it just makes your art more interesting overall. This is one of those things that I constantly have to remind myself to put into practice. I know to do it, but I'm not in the habit enough to do it automatically. I have to think to myself, what's the story here? Oh, I should add some kind of story to this. This is boring. I was reminded of it again earlier today when I was watching a Skillshare class by Gabrielle Piccolo. I've been following him on Instagram for a very long time and I saw that he posted that he now has a Skillshare class and I was like, ooh, and I ran over to Skillshare. I was like, I'm watching this. 
He's just very talented and I'm like, I want to learn things. <laughs> His Skillshare video is called Character Illustration, Drawing Facial Expressions, Figures, and Clothing. He covers so many great tips, a lot of them I had in my list for this video and I was like, hey, see, that's important. <laughs> and no matter how many times I learn things, I just like being reminded to put certain things into practice. He mentioned telling a story right towards the beginning of the lesson and I was like, yes, yes, <laughs> drill it into my skull. So I thought I would show some examples of telling a story versus not telling a story. So this one's pretty clearly telling a story. <laughs> I intended it to look like a children's picture book illustration, which is literally telling a story, even though with this there was no actual written story. And it's not like you need everything planned out. You're not like, okay, her name's Marsha, his name is Marshall, and this is little Timmy and Tommy. Like, no, you don't need <laughs> everything like that unless you want to. But just looking at this, you could see that this is a family of bunnies and they're about to sit down to have some food or something. They're just having like a little family moment. You can tell they live here because there are toys. She has a little baking sheet with cookies on it. There's a door, there's a window, there are clothes hanging on the line, they have a table. So you can assume that they live here. Little details like that help tell the story even if you don't have an actual story. Here's an example of something that's just kind of boring because there's really no story to it. He's in a basic pose. He's not interacting with any props or with any other characters. He's just standing there. There's not even anything in the background to indicate that there's something going on. And it's not that there's anything wrong with doing art like this, but if you're trying to do some kind of big finished piece, this would be a little boring. Here's another example of something that tells a story because you can see that there's this witchy looking lady and she's shopping for things. You can see the shelves behind her. She's holding up a potion bottle. She's looking at it. She has her shopping cart, her purse. So you can assume she's shopping. She's actually performing an action instead of just standing there like this. Here's another one that tells a story because you have a couple characters, you have an environment, you see things that relate to them like drawings and there's bunnies and hey, they're bunnies, they're making art, there's art on the walls, oh, they must have drawn this, little things like that. It's a scene, you're looking in on them doing something. And storytelling is not always as detailed or as obvious as this. Something like this is kind of an in-between where Really, she's in sort of a pinup pose where she's not really doing much of anything, but the other elements help paint a picture of who she is. I mean, she's literally Jasmine from Aladdin in this case in her red outfit, but it's not just her. There are other things related to the actual story. In the scene where she's in this outfit, she's surrounded by all kinds of coins and treasure. So I have treasure in the background. She gets trapped in a giant hourglass. So there's an hourglass behind her. They're just little things that relate to her. A random person looking at your art is not gonna know the whole story behind it, but they can get an idea of what's going on in the picture. And this one's not an actual scene either because she's really just posing here and then the hourglass and the coins and the border are just all background elements. She's not actually floating in front of an hourglass. But I thought that was a good example of kind of like an in-between where she's not really in a scene, but it just helps tell a little bit more about her. Point number six is to keep form in mind, and that is the volume an object has. It's 3D shape. This is something I see beginners struggle a lot with because, for example, they'll draw an arm and let's say this is a bracelet, they just draw a line straight across the arm, it doesn't extend past the arm, it's just there, almost like a tattoo. What I used to do to get around that is I would go outside the edge a little bit and round the edges and it's like, ooh, there's a bracelet. But really, a bracelet would only look like that if you're looking at it exactly from the side. And most of the time, that's not the case. You want objects to wrap around the character's form. Look how this is very cylindrical and the bracelet is actually wrapping around it. That's the kind of thing you have to keep in mind when drawing not only characters, but scenes in general. Here's someone's foot. They're wearing socks and sandals. <laughs> you can see the way the top of the sock is curving around the leg and how it sticks out further than the leg itself because the sock has thickness to it. And then with the sandal, you can see that it wraps around the shape of the foot not just a flat line across like this. So always try to picture different parts of your image as 3D shapes, it really helps. I just feel like this one little thing completely takes your art to the next level. I mean, that can be said of a lot of 
tips, but <laughs> this is just the one thing that sticks out to me every time I see a drawing by a beginner. For points number seven and eight, I'm gonna dive into my book here because I had good examples of this already drawn out. Tip number seven is to use thumbnails to plan out your art. Let me just read this directly from here. <laughs> a thumbnail is a small messy sketch used to plan your drawing. Think of it as the sketch before the sketch. Quick, simple doodles that map out what elements go where, how the character is posed, what colors you plan to use, and more. It's a great way to avoid mistakes down the road, and since a thumbnail is so quick to make, you can explore a wide range of ideas before committing to one. So here you see some examples of messy little thumbnails and then what the final line art ended up looking like. Tip number eight is to keep silhouettes in mind. Imagine taking one of your drawings and coloring the whole character pitch black. Would the pose or action still read clearly? If not, you need to rethink the character's silhouette. Woo. So this one needs improvement. If you look only at the silhouette, it's hard to know what the character is doing. The magnifying glass, which is the driving force of the character's action, overlaps with his body. His other arm is draped at his side, which doesn't add anything to the pose and makes the silhouette even less clear. This one is much better. By turning him to the side a bit and pulling the arms away from his body, the pose is more clear. If there is a prop driving the character's action, that prop needs to read clearly. Even without a prop, you should be thinking about the overall body silhouette. But it's not just about the pose. It's helpful to think of silhouettes when designing your character's body type, clothing, hair, and accessories. Here are some examples of designs created with the silhouette in mind. You should be able to guess what the character might look like based solely on their silhouettes. This guy you can tell has a big cape. This girl looks like she has big poofy hair. This person has some kind of long cloak type outfit with a staff. This girl has the big wavy ponies and her her pose is kind of girly and feminine. This guy looks a little macho and he's holding something. Just little things like that. You can see that these silhouettes are all very different from one another and help convey who the character is. So it's important not only for the pose, but the character design itself. You can discover many other drawing tips in my book. Do you know the way? Now, tip number nine is to use straights and curves. On this side, the hair is very round. There's one big curve here and one big curve here. And that doesn't necessarily look bad. That could totally be a stylistic choice, but you can make your art look a little more appealing by adding straights and curves. On this side, I tried to give his hair more structure and appeal by combining the straights and curves. So right here, there is a straight line. Then there's this curve along the top and then another straight line and a curve. Over on this side, again, it starts with a straight, then there's a curve, then a straight coming into his head. And the straight doesn't have to be perfectly straight, like with a ruler. Looking at this one, you can see it has the slightest bend to it. Again, it can be a stylistic choice, but personally, I prefer this one. I have some other examples of this. This one is an elbow and a forearm. On this side, you have curved lines on both sides of the arm. On this side, you have a straight here and a straight here, and this one's even a straight as well, but then this one curves. So these two lines that are opposite each other are different. One straight, one's got the curve. This kind of thing is really important to keep in mind when you're trying to stylize your art to look cartoony or like a comic book character or something. It's not necessarily about drawing exactly what a real arm would look like with every little bend and curve in the arm. It's about representing the arm with a more simple shape. You take in what you know about a real arm and simplify it. It's just a lot more appealing having the straights and curves. Here's another example of an arm using straights and curves. So the first one is all just smooth curves down the sides. This one, you've got this little straight under the thumb here. You can see this pointy edge and then it curves out and then a straight line comes in right here. And this doesn't have to be super pointy, like a super sharp edge. You can round it off a bit. So it can be like curve, slightly rounded corner, and then straight. On this side, this is a curve. It's, it's a little straight, but it's still a curve outwards. And then it cuts fairly straight inwards. And then the bottom is also straight. So those are some examples of adding straights and curves into your drawing. And finally, tip number 10 is to use composition to guide the viewer's eye through the piece. When you're referring to an arts composition, you're referring to how everything is laid out in the scene and how objects are laid out in relation to one another. So in this picture, 
the focal point, which is the point you want the viewer to look at, is the mermaid. I mean, obviously we want people to look at the whole thing, but the mermaid is the main focal point of the art. And more specifically, it's her upper body that's the focal point. It's where there's the most detail and it's where her faces, often faces, attract people's attention. And she's interacting with a seahorse, so their interaction is what you should be looking at. And like I said, the face will automatically grab your attention, but there are other things I did to get your attention on her. You'll notice that the seahorse she's looking at is facing her. Then there's this other seahorse which she's not interacting with, but it's still facing towards her. Look at this seaweed, it's curving towards her. Even this jellyfish, it's coming in towards her. Look at these orange plant thingies, curving up. This seaweed curving up, this fish looking up. It's all bringing your eye back to her. And sometimes guiding the viewer's eye doesn't mean, hey, look at this one spot. Sometimes it means, hey, start here, but then follow the curves of the art. Like, okay, her hair's flowing down, her legs coming up like this, and her body swoops. So your eye kind of starts here, but then it goes down her body, maybe swoops up here, follows the direction of these, the seaweed and the fish and comes back up. Like, your purpose may not be just to say, hey, look here. It might be, hey, start here and follow this path. So that is something to keep in mind as well. So those are my 10 drawing tips for beginning artists. And there are so many more I could have included in this video. Drawing is complicated, it can be a little scary, but just slowly chip away at it, slowly learn new things. It's a journey. There's always something new to learn. So just embrace it and don't let it scare you. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Let me know if you wanna see more videos like this. I did do a similar one about coloring tips, so I'll have that one linked down below if you wanna see that. Also, don't forget about that Skillshare offer. The link is down below. Get your first two months for free. Check out the website, see if it's something you're interested in, and see what kind of tutorials are on there. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in my next video.